Just a little bit of background. We're going to be in uh, Mark chapter 10. No, I'm actually going to be in sequence with a series, a two-part series that Miles is doing on stewardship. And this is part one, and I'm actually using his notes that he's given us for this, this message. He had intended to be here, and I, I did this once before at another church where the pastor got sick at the last minute. And I found out like five minutes before the service that I was going to be doing the service. And so I had his notes to be able to preach from. And I went through the Bible study using his notes. And at the end of the Bible study, and it went okay, a dear woman came up to me and she says, you know, Pastor Mickey, I've known you for years and I've sat through a lot of your Bible studies. And she said, I just have to tell you that was the best Bible study you've ever given. (laughs) And so, um, if you like our study today, please don't tell me it was the best Bible study you've ever heard, but but tell that to Miles. That's his gift to you. These are his uh, notes and the the themes that we're looking at. Now, a little background, if we haven't met, uh, I I was raised in Southern California. Uh, I wasn't raised in the church. I came to faith in college. I grew up in Hermosa Beach. Uh, My dad was a police officer. And when I uh, was about nine years old, my mom came down with cancer, and we had four children in our family. My brothers were older. My sister was four years older than me. And uh, through the bout with cancer, eventually she succumbed, and, and she went to be with the Lord when I was 12 years old. Well, my big sister then started to kind of be my best friend, and she took over that mothering place in my life. And uh, she was looking over me and all of that. Well, three years later, she was killed in a, a car accident. And for me, it kind of really rocked my world. To, it's like I, I wanted family. And my brothers had, were older. They moved out. And our family was a bit fractured and didn't have that close family. And I, I grew up just longing for that. I went and got my bachelor's degree, actually, in child development and got my teaching credential. I wanted to teach elementary school. That was where I was pursuing in my studies. Worked at the recreation department, worked with uh, kids in the, the, uh, in the city. And then I came to the Lord and naturally got involved with children, with youth and family, and became a youth pastor for about 18 years. And it was there that I actually met my wife. Uh, now, my uh, birth name I've shared before, my birth name is actually Claude, which means lame one <laughs> in Latin. <laughs> so that's who you get. My, my wife, Karen, means pure one. And I met her at a prayer meeting. And she got involved right away with the children. And she came from a family of seven children. She wanted a big family. Our friendship grew, and the Lord drew us together in, in, in ministry and in marriage. And just my best friend, very godly woman, and we shared the same passion to have a family, and as the years went by, we we weren't having children. She didn't have a monthly cycle. Her cycle was annual. And so medically, we sought intervention, and and she ended up getting pregnant, and we she had a tubal pregnancy where she they removed one of the fallopian tubes, and then we got uh, pregnant a couple more times and had miscarriages, a couple miscarriages, then had another tubal on the other side where it eventually passed through. But our, our doctor said that most likely this is normal for us, that we wouldn't have children. And so we were open to adoption. We enjoyed family, and maybe that was our calling to, to help raise other people's children that had need. And so we were just, whatever you have, Lord. And 25 years ago, though, she got pregnant, and we had a little girl. Uh, my oldest child, 25 years old, Shiloh. And then two years after that, she got pregnant again, and we had twins, uh, a boy and a girl. Two years after that, she got pregnant again. (laughs) So we had three girls and a boy, four children under four. Insanity, okay? (laughs) Now, in, in parenting, you know, when you have two children or one child, you know, it's kind of like, okay, we can manage this. Once you get two, it's like man to man defense. And then when there's three, you, you move to zone. <laughs> With four, you automatically go to prevent, you know, and it's, sometimes it's a forfeit where it just kind of can be overwhelming. That's when I became an expert in stress management and teach stress management seminars and things like that. Well, in fact, I, we went back to the doctor, and I told the doctor, I said, doctor, could you make her the way she was, you know? <laughs> um, but I, I share that because... 
lo and behold, my oldest daughter um, got married to a wonderful guy, and then they have two children, and so I am now. In fact, my legal name has been changed to Bapa. Uh, <laughs> as my uh, oldest granddaughter, she's four years old, Kennedy, she refers to me as Bapa. And a number of months, just a few months, a number of months ago, I got to babysit, just me alone, in a date with Bapa and Kennedy, and we went to... Uh, uh, to um, Chuck E. Cheese, and then to Legoland, and just spoiling her rotten to pieces. And then that night, you know, we had dinner, and I'm all alone. I get to put her to bed that night, and we, our tradition will read a Bible story from her devotional and sing a song, and then we pray. And in her little princess bed, she was all tucked in, and she was kind of propped up a little bit, and I kneeled beside her bed, and I folded my hands and my elbows were on her bed, and I'm just praying that God would bless her and have his hand on her life and her parents and all of that. And as I'm praying, my eyes are closed, and I'm praying, and I sense her rustling and leaning forward. All of a sudden, she kisses me on the neck and then starts kissing me on the face, and she said, Papa, I love you. You know, at that moment, in fact, I changed my will. She gets it all. <laughs> My four kids aren't real happy with her at this time. but uh, And so I walk out of her room, kissed her on the forehead, and I'm walking down the hall, and God just spoke to my heart as clear as day. He said, do you get it? This is all I want. This is all I desire from your heart. Unforced, unpressured, but the expression of a heart to just say, Abba, Father, I love you. I love you. And sometimes we have perspectives of church or religion. We have the rules and obligations and duties and the guilt, and we miss that God, God is wanting to, to call out from all eternity right down into our lives, into our homes, into our situations, where you work, that he wants to love upon you. He wants to do, and all that he's doing in your life, he's drawing you to this place, this intimate place where you had reached this place where you just say, Abba, Father, be my daddy. I love you. Now, as we start this week and next week on stewardship, a lot of times we have misperspectives. Mispers we, we think it's obligations. We're going to talk about our giving, our time, our talent, our treasure. Now, again, some of the visitors are here. Oh, man, it's the first time I bring them to church. Miles isn't here, and now they're going to talk about money? No, that's not what we're dealing with. We're talking about a stewardship, the responsibility we have in our perspective of who owns what. Do your possessions own you? Or you're in a place with this relationship with the Lord where truly he, he, you have surrendered, as we, we've saying, I surrender all. What does that mean? Now turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. And it's a, an amazing record here, historical record of a, a young, affluent individual that comes to the Lord. Mark 10, Matthew, Mark, it's the second gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament, recording the teaching, sayings, the miracles, and the life of Jesus Christ. In verse 17, we pick up here, it says, now as he, which is in reference to Jesus, as he was going out on the road, one came running and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now imagine this young ruler, a young leader. He comes running up, sees Jesus, and actually kneeling down a posture of, of, of honor, recognizing who he is perhaps. And he asks what I would personally believe is the most important question. If you had one question to ask God, the most imp important question that anyone could ask him is, what can I do to get to heaven? What is it? Is, what is your standard? What is it I need to know and believe to have eternal life? Now Jesus said to him, he turns and verse 18 says, well, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. Now, 
any Jewish individual would be taught that there is one God. There is only one, one good, no others, no not one, only God alone in their synagogues was taught that God alone is good. So Jesus is asking, are you recognizing me as deity? Is that why you're calling me good? Good teacher? And so Jesus says, no one is good but one, that is God. And then verse 19, he says, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. Now, in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, there's, there's ten commandments. Four, the first four, deal with our relationship with God. In fact, it can be summarized, the law can be summarized, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The last six of the commandments are dealing with us, relationships, human to human, person to person, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And so Jesus records for him a number of those commandments that are relationship. But he leaves off, thou shalt not covet. Now, purposefully, I believe he knows the heart of this individual, and he goes on, and, and Jesus clearly isn't saying, if you do this, this is what's necessary to be saved. No, he's instructing this individual because he knows what's blocking this individual from the relationship with God and what God is wanting in his heart. Verse 20, and he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, listen to what it says, loved him. Jesus, looking at him, with a sense of compassion, loving him, knowing right to the heart of his issue, and said to him, Then one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up your cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You see, the Lord knew what the issue was that was keeping him from the Lord. He kneeled, he called out, he asked the right question, but the Lord knew his heart. I believe Miles has probably told you before, but in Africa, the Kiala monkeys, uh, the rhesus monkeys, they have uh, different ways of dealing with these monkeys in Africa. They come and steal the fruit and the, the, the harvest. They take the food from the farmers and they go up into the trees and the farmers have challenges with them and they figured a way, <clears throat> a humane way to deal with them. And what they do is they, they take coconuts and they carve out a small hole in the top of the coconut and they fill it with rice and food that the monkeys like and a fragrant uh, smell that allures them. And then they chain these coconuts to the ground out around the crops. And during the day or night, when the monkeys come out of the tree, they put their hands in the coconut to get the food. And the nature of the hole is they can get their hands in, but when they grab the food, they, food, they can't pull their hands out. And at that point, they get frantic, and the chains start to rattle, and they start to screech, and the farmers just come walking up to the monkeys, and they will capture them in their bag and load them up and displace them to another area far away from where their farms are. Now, here's the picture. You have these monkeys that they reach in, and they won't let go, and they start to scream and holler, but all they have to do is let go just let go, their hands would slide out. This rich young ruler was similar to this. He was holding on to the very things that would destroy his life. Jesus appealing to him right to the heart. He loved him, knowing that this was not life. And many of us, I mean the old adage, let go and let God, uh, very true in this situation. Verse 23, he goes on, it says, Jesus looked around him to his disciples. His disciples there now, they're watching this take place, and he starts to instruct them. He says, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. Now the disciples were astonished at his words. And Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches. Notice he didn't say who have riches, but who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. 
it is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man or to a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. There was a colloquial, collo- you know the word. There was a saying, <laughs> colloquialism, um, in Persia. They had a statement of impossibility that it's easier for an elephant to go through the eye of a needle. And in Palestine, the largest animal was a camel. And so making that statement of what was impossible, he says in verse 26, and they were greatly astonished saying among themselves, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Now we're dealing with this concept of stewardship. Now stewardship is not just dealing with our money. Again, it's our time, how we value our life, our talents, the gifts, and the calling that's upon our lives as well as what we own or uh, the, the possessions. And the, the concept in the Bible is that God owns it all and we're stewards. I realize that my children as their father, they belong to the Lord. We have a child dedication class that we do here. The marriage and family pastor, he'll teach a class for the parents to understand we're just stewards. We're stewards over our children. In fact, it's 1 Peter chapter 4, 14 says, As each one of us has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And Jesus here getting to the very heart of the matter in Matthew chapter 6, 21, which Miles will look at next week as well, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Now you may be sitting here saying, well, I'm not rich. That's not in reference to me. Well, let me just give you some stats or actually information on uh, perspectives of how we live in America. In fact, if you reduce the world population percentage-wise down to 100 people and the world's population viewed uh, sociologically, if we had 100 people, it would break down like this. 60 would be Asian, 12 European, 15 from the Western Hemisphere, 13 would be African, and only five would live in North America. Now, 52 would be female, 48 would be male. That's why there's a little shortage on men, ladies. I apologize for that. 73 would be non-white. Caucasian would be the minority, 27. 67 would be Christian, Catholic Protestant. 33 would be non-Christian. Six would possess 59% of the world's wealth. And four of these six would live in the United States. Eighty would live in substandard housing. One out of five wouldn't be able to read. Thirty-three would be suffering from malnutrition. One would own a computer, and one would have a college education. Now, there's an interesting book that was published last year called Passing the Plate. The two authors are PhDs, one from from Harvard. They work as sociologists at Notre Dame. They wrote this book, and they're evaluating evangelical Christianity and looking at just different aspects of of how we view our stewardship in the church. And I quote from the book. They write, self-identified Christians who are actually members of churches who attend church twice a month or more who consider themselves either strong or very strong Christians earned a total collective 2005 income of more than $2 trillion. That's an annual income of $2 trillion. This is more than the total gross domestic products of every nation in the world except for the six wealthiest, the United States, Japan, Germany, China, the UK, and France. That would make Christians of America the seventh most prosperous nation in the world. Now, if we as a people had a concept even of tithe, like 10%, the world would be transformed. I doubt there would be hunger. I doubt very much so on an annual basis the social problems that we see. And we look at this and think, well, and I, and I, I do want to honestly affirm here at The Rock, you are a very benevolent giving, 
involved group of people. And I realize this standard or this statistics looking across the nation, and we're so blessed to be part of a group of people that, for the most part, understand the concepts or are beginning to understand the concepts of stewardship. But it goes on to say that one out of five Christians, these are active Christians, actively, actually give nothing, never have tithe, nor have been involved in any aspect of service with their talents. That's a scary statistic. Now, you still might be thinking, well, I'm not rich. Well, if your family income, combined income in your household, tallies up to $10,000 a year, you're in the top 13% of wealth in the world. Now, in 19, or 2007, the median household income was reported in the United States Combined income of a household is $50,000. That's the average. If you live the average household income of $50,000 combined income, that puts you in the top 1% of the world's wealthiest people. Now let me share with you how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. This concept of stewardship now, here's a young man that asked, how do I get to heaven? Now, Jesus isn't saying, okay, sell everything and be obedient and be a good person to get to heaven. No, it's by grace. But he's getting to the very heart. As Martin Luther and our pastor Miles has shared before, that often the wallet is the last part of a person to get saved. And I want to share honestly, we... I, I want nothing from you. Everything I'm talking is what I want for you. God doesn't need your money. As, as pastors, we're, we're not trying to beg that you would give for God's work. God will do his work. When we are stewards and participate with God, he gives us the privilege to joining him in the work. And a tithe actually in the Bible, the Old Testament, the tithe actually, the required giving in the Old Testament adds up to about 25%, 23 to 25%. In the New Testament, he doesn't say give 10%. That's a, a tithe is, is a, a part of our giving. The New Testament says, search your heart. Store up that which you set aside to care for God's work in the community, for the poor, for the needs, the needs of the church. It's that you pray and realize, Lord, it belongs to you, and I'm giving to you. Now, I draw your attention to our study guide here um, as our, our final concluding four points. Biblical stewardship. Now, let me share number one. Um, Miles, this, these are his notes, <laughs> and my four, my, uh, several of my kids, they were... You know, I was going over what I was needing to do and preach his notes, and it starts off, it's not your life. And they go, Dad, like, that is not yo. <laughs> yo, yo. That, you know, Miles, that, you know, that is his personality and stuff. And they said, Dad, Miles is cool. <laughs> he can say, not your life. And it's like, don't try to be cool, okay? Just, like, just... It's, it's not your life, okay? God is so good. Yo, yo. <laughs> See, I grew up a yo, yo was what you did with string, you know? <laughs> well, here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says, The Lord God formed the dust of the ground and gave unto his no, uh, into his nostrils the breath of life and became a living being. The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life, Job 33, 4. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands, Paul said, as though he needs anything, since he gives to all life breath and all things. Your very breath is given to you as a gift. All that you are, God has given you as a gift. And we're just stewards over the life that we've been given. And he says, enter into the joy of the Lord, good and faithful servant. He just requires us not to be 
the smartest, not to be the best, not to be the brightest, but to be faithful with what God has given you within your time, your talent, your treasure, that you would be faithful. Uh, we're going to run a l- little testimony. And let me share, again, all the ministries here at The Rock are here to serve you. And we're offering a, a class coming up in a couple weeks. Next week you'll be able to sign up. But it's The Rock Financial Life Course. And it's one of our core courses that we offer here as part of the Army. And it's to teach more on stewardship, to help you get out of debt and all the burdens and the world's perspectives. And it just goes through Scripture and lays a foundation to how we live. And you will be blessed in in learning this information. And so uh, as part of this, we're going to play a testimony in relationship to one person's story. So go ahead, draw your attention to the Rock TV. First of all, what I was looking for in the class was a way to get out of the situation I was in. I was used to making a lot of money. I'm a real estate agent, and for 23 years, I made an average of over $300,000 a year. And all of a sudden, I could see that coming to a screeching halt, and I didn't know what to do, so I thought that I would take the class. I was paying attention to making money. I was putting money first, so I didn't, God was secondary. I didn't realize it because I thought that he was in my heart first. During the first class, I I was ready to fund a loan, a $90,000 refinance on my house. It was, you know, the loan docs were drawn. All I had to do was sign them and that money would have been in my account. And I was doing that because I saw that the economy was going sour and I said, I better grab what I can and hold on to it. And after I took that class, I called my lender, who's a good friend, and I said, cancel it, I'm not gonna fund it. I am watching every penny I spend. I don't waste a penny. I talked to my oldest daughter and asked her what she was doing and she said, "Um, we're doing, she just got married and she said, we're doing our budget. And I couldn't believe it, I've never said those words, you know, and um, and my other daughters too are responsible. So that for me is such a gift I didn't expect because I haven't been that type of example. It was, it was a change I decided to make and that trickled down to, you know, some of their experiences. So I thought they would resent that and instead they've embraced it and we have like Sunday night dinner where we're all cooking and instead of going out to eat. I know that if, if I uh, don't make very much money, I know that it's not going to surprise him. I know he knows that, and I know he's going to take care of me anyway. Every single person that I know is affected by the economy right now. There's nobody that's been immune to it. You can't put your trust in money. You can't count on anything but God. The class was overwhelming because there were hundreds of ideas, hundreds of solutions, and I couldn't, couldn't take it all in, but every time I would go to a class, um, I would take a little bit at a time and um, try to change things. And so, you know, now I've had a year and I'm still nowhere near done, but I've changed so many aspects. But most importantly, that class helped me to change my heart. I would recommend it to anybody. I'm choked up. <laughs> well, number one. It's not your. Okay, repeat after me. It's not. Come on, you gotta do better than that. It's. Okay, there we go. Number two, it's not your job. It's not your job. You see, God puts us in places for His purpose. The giftings that He gives us. Listen to the scripture here, Deuteronomy eight. 18, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant, which He swore to your fathers as it is to this day. You know, the job you have, the intelligence you have, the physical ability you have is a gift from God. He made you this way. Uh, The personality, the temperament, He's designed you for His purposes that you would use those talents for his purposes. In Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the, uh, of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It's a great book. It talks about mission and calling called The Theology of Dogs and Cats. 
And in fact, in the very beginning, a friend here gave or encouraged me to, to read it. In the very beginning, it says, a dog says, you pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, you love me, you must be God. The cat says, you pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, you love me, I must be God. <laughs> now, how many, uh, they just had a survey this week on, you know, loving dogs or cats. How many of you love dogs? Well, the, the survey this year, one out for dog lovers. How many of you love cats? It's okay. How many of you love dogs who eat cats? Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, you're sick people. <laughs> it's, uh, here's a great word for you, theopocentric. The dog theology is theopocentric, where you realize that God is the center. Everything finds meaning in relationship to him, as opposed to anthropocentric, which is a, a human-centered, self-centered, egocentric perspective of life. It's about me. Now, you hear your pastor all the time sharing, it's not about you. No, no, he says this. It's not about yo. No, it's not about you. It's having a perspective that it belongs to God. And we're just stewards over our time, our talent, our treasure. Lord, I give to you with joy in my heart that which I store up. I serve you with joy in my heart because you've created me for your purpose. Number three, it's not your money. The scripture says in Haggai, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. I have a friend who has a pastor, uh, he's a pastor in Las Vegas, and they have services 24 hours a day because the casinos open all day, and people come in and different worship services, two in the morning, uh, to service the needs. And he was sharing that the Catholic church has the same thing, and we have a lot of Catholics that go to Vegas, and sometimes they go to confession afterwards, feeling guilt, and then they give money, and in Las Vegas, they give so many poker chip winnings and all the different casinos, and they have these plates full of all the different poker chips from different casinos that they actually have actually full-time workers there to separate the chips. They're called chipmunks. I don't, I don't know if you read that, but <laughs> I'm, so, I'm just reading Miles' notes, okay? Just reading his notes. Send your complaints to him. Well, number four, and finally, it's not your stuff. Let go. Let go of the stuff, that open hand to allow God. It's his car. It's his house. It's his neighborhood that you find the joy that God lives through you as just stewards of what belongs to him. The earth is the Lord's and its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. And then finally, Psalm 50 Every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle of a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in all its fullness. In Psalm 50. So as we continue next week on this concept of stewardship, as we become stewards over what belongs to God, it's His now again, our first question, in fact, the oldest writing in human records is the book of Job. In fact, in that writing, in, in the Bible, in chapter 14, verse 14, this question pops up again where Job says, if a man dies, will he live again? If a person dies, is there life after death? This rich young ruler asks, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answers that question in John 11 where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who lives and believes in me, though he die, though uh, he live, he shall never die. You know it's impossible? It's impossible to get to heaven apart from God's saving grace and mercy. And we in America live in a very tempting place. And I had a gentleman come up to me, with tears in his life. He said, you, you were speaking right to me and you described my life. He said, I've played the fool. I've listened to the lies. I didn't let go. I thought it was about affluence rather than influence. 
And he said, all I wanted was a good family, and I got caught up in the trappings of the world and pursuing the things of the world. I've lost my family, I've lost my marriage, I've lost my children, I've lost it all. Stewardship has to do with life. And a God who desperately wants his people to discover this abiding relationship of love. He loves you so much. Would you pray with me? Lord, I do thank you for this beautiful church. So many people doing so many amazing things. Lord, our lives belong to you. Our money belongs to you. Our careers belong to you. All that we are truly belongs to you. And I pray that we would grasp hold of just even the hem of your garment to beg your grace, to beg your mercy, to know that, Lord, we don't want to be encumbered about by the things of this world that pull us back, the allurements that are so strong, so real, but they lead us down a wrong path. If you're here tonight and there's just a stirring in your heart and you just know that you know that it's time for you to surrender to the Lord. It's time for you to let go and allow God to take rule in your heart. Would you just, in the quietness of your heart, to say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for doing things my way. Forgive me for trying to control it all, living for the pursuits of this world. Lord, I, I want to surrender to you. With me, it's impossible, but I know with you, all things are possible. And so by faith, I ask Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to take the reins of my heart and set me on a path of love. And so this day, I pray that you would receive me into your family. I surrender to you in Jesus' name. Amen.